to do some things that were pretty exciting, pretty fun, pretty pretty cool. But my slideshow didn't work this morning, so so you're you're not going to see the slides. And next week I'll be at the men's retreat. But the week after, if Jay will let us, I'll show that slideshow. But I'll tell you a little bit about it, so you're, you you can decide whether you want to come and watch it or not. The first thing we did was a, I got in on a Monday night at midnight, and Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock would be in a, a uh, leadership conference, so which kept it pretty exciting, kept me awake, and except for about 11 o'clock, and I was sitting while somebody else was talking, and it got pretty tough for a few minutes. Uh, and I think they understood. Anyway, they didn't throw things at me. So I was, uh, I was there. I was able to teach six times in that conference, and it was really a blessing to be able to do that. I taught on um, discipleship. I taught on. I was going to teach on fellowship. But we didn't have time to get to that. I taught on uh, stewardship, and asked some of the local pastors to teach as well on that because stewardship is something that is somewhat how cultural. And you may not realize that we have our own culture here that we don't escape from so often. And we have our ideas about how you give and how you participate in the church's financial needs. So we had we talked about that. And then I also talked on something, I a new word that I coined called fellowship. Okay. So it means basically how do we follow the Lord? How do we, how do we follow him in our lives? So we were able to do that together. We did um, three days of, of conference, and the last afternoon of that conference was a team-building experience. How many of you have ever been on a team-building experience? A few of you have, not very many. So team-building experience sounds like you're doing something that you just kind of you hug each other and, and you say sweet nothings in each other's ear. So a team-building experience, we did tug-of-wars. We did a, a musical competition which was interesting. The theme for the church in Entebbe this year is tools for kingdom use. And so we were all given the challenge to, in five minutes, write and prepare the words, the background music, and any kind of dancing that would go with that, <laughs> and then to present. And the Africans love to dance. You've, you probably have sensed that from things that you've seen and heard. And so it's hard for me this morning, for example, to stand there and, and just praise the Lord. I thought, <laughs> moving a little bit. So there, those, those musical pieces were all um, amazing for, for five minutes worth of preparation. And uh, what else did we do? Oh, they did another, another uh, we'll call it an athletic activity, where you had to run about, uh, uh, about 50 yards and then to, and there was a stake in the ground, and you had to put your hand on top of the stake, put your forehead on the top of your hand, and then spin around 10 times, <laughs> and then run back. And it was most interesting. I, I stepped aside for that because I got a leg that's given me some trouble. So I didn't participate. And to watch the ones who had the most difficult time with this, they were the pastors in the crowd. And it's like, I mean, maybe everybody else had had some experience with dizziness before or disorientation. Those pastors didn't have a clue. So they came off of spinning 10 times and they should have been going this way and they were going that way. <laughs> and they couldn't correct. They couldn't correct as hard as they tried. And they finally just fell down. <laughs> and then we all laughed together because it was, it was humorous. For most of us anyway. So uh, <laughs> the team building was an exciting thing. It was a great time. Uh, the team I was on came in third out of three. Well, okay. <laughs> so we didn't do particularly well, but everybody had a great time, and it did actually help to, to build the fellowship and to build the group together. Leaving there then, I don't even remember Friday. Friday was supposed to be a day to get visas to go to the Sudan, and you may have heard that I was hoping to go to the Sudan. Sudan is in the middle of the um, the rainy season, and in the rainy season, the roads are closed, so you have to fly. Okay, well, that sounds all right, but then you find out the airports are slippery, so they don't fly either, <laughs> and you can't walk. It's, you know, it's a thousand miles or something like that, so you don't do, you can't get in, so we had to cancel the Sudan trip and reschedule it for January when... Um, it's supposed to be dry and everybody's supposed to be loving and happy with each other in the Sudan. 
which doesn't happen often. So we'll find out how that works out. Um, then on Saturday, I went to a, a, a Kwanjula. Everybody knows what a Kwanjula is, right? Yeah, I thought so. So a Kwanjula is also called an introduction. An introduction is also called a an engagement party. Okay, so there's a term that you can relate to. And in this, the, they have some pomp and circumstance. It's not just to sit around and drink punch and uh, tell stories about when the bride was three years old and all those kinds of things. It's, it actually has a ceremony. And they had dancers, professional dancers. They had a singer. They had... Um, they had a march where, which, and, and I noticed I didn't even get that picture. I must have thrown it out somehow. So I'll tell you about it. Where the the bridal party comes marching into the middle of this lawn area. You have a, a tent set up on one side of the lawn with the groom's family, and a tent set up on the other side of the lawn with the bride's family and friends. And then all of these things are going on in between. The families can't be together. They have to be separated. We're, we don't know each other yet. We haven't been officially introduced. Well, the bride and the groom, they probably know each other pretty well by this time, but officially, there's no introduction. So they, the bridal party comes into the middle, and they're all lined up in basically pairs, and they walk in, and they have a an Anglican priest who's part of this crowd that's coming in, and they have a number of other people who look very official. And then the, the groom comes in, and then there are about 15 young women who come in, and they have hoods over their faces, over their heads. You cannot see who they are. Isn't that interesting? Sounds kind of weird. And they all came in and they all sat down. And in order for the groom, this isn't done in all of these. This happened to be their particular way to do it. In order for the groom to accept the bride, he had to go and figure out which one of these women it was. <laughs> What a challenge. You see, you know, some people you're going to be able to throw out because they're nowhere near the physical shape of, of the one that you want to, to marry. So that was on Saturday. On Sunday, they actually had the wedding with this same couple. It's very unusual to have them there close together. It's more like six, nine months, a year between the time these two happened. So the wedding, again, was great, and, and uh, you'll see a slide on that when the time comes. Then um, on Wednesday of that following week, um, basically I took the church in, in Entebbe and did their, their pastors and leaders uh, training in the morning. And then I taught Wednesday evening. And then Thursday morning, Pastor Isaac, who some of you may have met, and I left the area. And I was, I was thinking about this this morning. I thought, you know, Bob came up here and he was saying Paul Bunyan. And then, and then he was able to say, oh, no, that's John Bunyan. And then, oh, no, that's John Newton. And then I'm sitting back here thinking, oh, no, then there's Isaac Newton, and then there's Isaac Wabamba. Okay, that's my lead in. <laughs> so Pastor Isaac Wabamba and I left, and he, he had been here in the spring. And I took him to one of my favorite places in the world, which is, what would you think it might be? Yosemite, not Starbucks. <laughs> so I took him to Yosemite. And um, so he was overwhelmed with Yosemite. So he wanted to give me something like that when we were there. So we went to a place called CP Falls, which is on the, the slopes of Mount Elgon, the fifth highest peak in the, in the uh, continent, which is only 14,000 feet, right? Same as the Sierras here. So it, uh, it's, but it's a nice, it's a beautiful mountain. It's a, it's a volcanic mountain. So it has, you know, it stands kind of by itself. But we were on the slopes of that and CP Falls was beautiful and amazing. And that was just in the way of going to Soroti, Calvary Chapel of Soroti, which is a church plant from Calvary Chapel in Tebe. And so we went there and um, worked with uh, the leadership on Saturday. And then on Sunday, I got to teach again in the morning. And then we quickly headed back for Entebbe because we were planning on heading for Bolinga, another little town, um, on Monday. Uh, that didn't work out, but Monday night I flew home. So that was the trip. That's kind of the things that happened. And when you see the slides, you'll see so I, I, I put some, it's in a PowerPoint presentation, so it has some words that go with the slides, and you can see the kinds of things that happened and how they tie together. And it was a great time. You know, God always does his work. If we allow ourselves to be used, he uses us. And it's, it's pretty simple. That's, that's the way it works. 
So uh, I hope that's where you are in your life, that you're allow allowing God to use you every day. Well, today we're going to be looking at the topic of being grounded. Now, it's interesting because when I was in Africa and I, I taught this same message, I said, you know, it's this term actually has more than one meaning. And it might be like grounding an airplane. And that's not really what I intend here. I intend being grounded or founded in the Word of God. Grounded in your faith and in your walk. And this morning, somebody looked at the, the title of the message and said, I don't want to be grounded. <laughs> and you're thinking about, well, I don't, when I was a kid, grounding wasn't an option. That wasn't on the list of things you could be. You could be beaten, you could be whipped, you could be banished, you could be kicked out of the house. But grounded is something that's a little more modern. You know, it's the, and some of you may not even know what it means. Is that really true? So it's a, it's a method that's used for disciplining children today, in case you don't know. And it basically means you're, you're not going out, you're, you're going to spend some time apart until you've thought through this whole thing that you've gotten yourself into and how you've impacted everybody else. Well, we're not talking about that today. We're talking about being grounded in the Word and grounded in God and grounded in your walk. And the text for today's message is in... Um, Acts chapter 2, so if you could be turning there, that would be great. Acts chapter 2, and, we're gonna, and the main text is in verses 38 through 41. <clears throat> so, but let's, let's talk about some background, and then we're going to read those verses together and see what God wants to teach us. So, Acts chapter 2, it's a famous chapter. It's one that there are a lot of things going on in, and the chapter begins with one of the most dramatic events in all of the Bible. It's the day of Pentecost, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it is presented as this amazing sound and light show that's never been seen or heard before. The sound is the sound of a mighty rushing wind from above and the sound of tongues from the people who are below. Those are languages that people who have come from all over the Jewish world can, can understand. And it's a miraculous thing. And then the light is tongues of fire that have come from above and end up on apparently very close to the heads of those who are experiencing this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it's a sound and light show that's unmatched. Maybe Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus has a little similarity because it was this extremely bright light that came from heaven and a sound, a voice that came from heaven that he understood. So that shows up in, in chapter 9 of Acts, and it's repeated in, verse, in chapter 22 and chapter 26. And so these are amazing, miraculous events that highlight the New Testament. So that's what happens at the beginning of chapter 2. That's the beginning of the story. The second thing that happens is the people who have seen this, who haven't experienced it, but they're the spectators in this whole thing, take a look at those who have now spoken in tongues, and they say, Something's not right here. We've never seen this before. This is weird. And some people think it's just amazing, and other people think these folks are drunk. So Peter feels like it's important that he's, he defends what's happened. So Peter gets up, and he preaches. This is the first time we have a recording of Peter preaching. This is Peter who has now been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he's a little bit different guy than he was before this time. Before he was pretty much 100% uh, uh, in this direction or 100% in that direction. Now he's 100% in this direction. And he's a changed man. So we see him get up and he preaches. And the first thing he does in his message is he talks about the Old Testament basis for what's happening. It's, it's the foretelling of the Messiah. And he uses two different prophecies of the Messiah. He uses one from Joel, and he uses one from David. And these are people with whom his audience is extremely familiar. These aren't strangers to them. These are all Jews, practicing Jews. They're the ones who've come to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the Pentecost time. And so they're ones who know that what he's saying. And they're familiar with those 
sections of Scripture. But the next thing he does, then he tells about the Messiah revealed. And this is news to most of them. And it comes all down to what he has said in verse 36. And that is that Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, a little tough there, is the Messiah. And this is brand new information for them. And so they listen to it. And then in verse 37, they say, well, what are we supposed to do? And that's where the message begins today. But we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So in verse 42, we see the beginning of the church. The church as we know it today didn't exist before this time. And so we have now a new thing that's happened, and it's the church, the birth of the church. So as we see, we look at verse 42, and, and it's, a, it's a very popular, very common set of verses that talks about how the, how the church functioned in its early days. And if we think about it today, we would really like it to function in those same aspects today. We may not do things exactly the same, but we ought to pick up the important aspects of it as a church today. It talks about things like teaching of the word and fellowship and looking out for the good of each other. <clears throat> so when you look at the difference between before and after the church began, the first thing you see is those who were worshiping were Jews. But after the church began, those people were called Christians. Exactly. So before the church began, they became Jews by birth. But after the church began, you became a Christian by rebirth. Rebirth. So before the church began, all of the people looked out for their own individual good. They said, I'm going to look out for me. I'm not really too concerned about the rest of the people in the room. But after the church began, corporate good became the key. So we were looking out for each other making sure that all of us are walking together successfully. Before the church began, the people walked in the name of God. They were the people of God. They were Israel, the, the people that God had set aside. But after the church began, we began to walk the life of God, actually living the life, not just carrying the name, but living the life of God. And then the fifth item is before the church began, they lived in the law. And now that the church is beginning, they were living in grace. So big changes happened as the church began. So that's the background. That's the information, the text, the context that you see in chapter 2. And as we go through today, we're going to be looking at the context across a larger portion of Scripture and make sure that we're not getting too far off base. And I will warn you, I'm going to say some things today that may challenge your theology once in a while. And if it challenges to the point where you think, um, that guy's goofed up, then, uh, well, praise God for you. And uh, may it drive you to the Scripture to see if you come to the same conclusions I came to. And if you don't, praise God. I'm still going to see you in heaven. So, even though I may be a, a horrible heretic. No. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 41. Let's read them together. And I'll be reading from the ESV version of the Bible. It says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this wicked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it speaks to us. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is alive and well and wants to uh, make an impression upon our lives of some things today that maybe we haven't thought about or maybe we just need to be reminded of that will bring us close to you and make us more useful in your kingdom. So bless your word. And God, as we share together, I just pray, God, that we would be equipped in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, let's, let's take a look at verse 38 in more detail. The first thing it says that we are to repent, and you've, you know this term, and you've, you've heard it many times, and repentance isn't just something we do one time. And I think that's the thing that we, we tend to forget, is that repentance is something that, as long as you're a, a normal human being, there are times throughout your life when repentance is important. You're gonna have to do it again and again. You're gonna have to re-repent, if that's a word, as time goes on. We need to be sensitive to what's happening in our lives, the kind of things that have entered our lives that we need to repent from. So as he looks at repentance, I'll tell you the New Testament context. This idea of repenting is also presented just a, a short time later in Acts when Peter goes to a lame beggar, or the lame beggar comes to him, and he says, what should I do? And he says, the first thing you should do is repent. So he says that to the lame beggar. So the next group of people or groups of people that is actually said to are Jews and Greeks. So the Jews and the Greeks are also told they're supposed to repent. That's a big group of people. It's all the Jews, all the people who are his current audience and the Greeks who will be his future audience as he runs into them. And it probably should also include us because we're more Greek than we are Jew. I think some of you may be Jewish, but most of us have Greek minds, at least as Jay would remind us so often, we're, we're people who reason and think through things maybe way too much. And so uh, that's the second group of people. Then the third approach about repentance is there's a, one man who's told that he has to repent. His name is Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He's told that he needs to repent. And so we see that this is a message that is common in the New Testament. So here we see Peter saying that to these people now who've asked, what are we supposed to do? Well, number one, repent. What's it mean to repent? Well, I took two, three different approaches at repentance and to just help me understand and maybe help you understand too that repentance has some different aspects. First is that we need to change direction. So if you were heading in that direction, I'm gonna change and go in this direction. So it's not doing the same thing, it's, it's getting, away from what you've been doing, the things that have held you back or get you, have had you doing something you ought not to be doing. So in changing direction, how do you know how to change direction? Well, first thing you need to do is to know what is wrong. Understand what's wrong in your life. Well, once you understand what's wrong in your life and you say, well, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore, then you get this big hole in your life. So what you need to fill it with is, is knowing what is right. So replace what is wrong with what is right. And once you've replaced what's wrong with what is right, the next thing you need to do is to do it. Not just know it, but do it. So we need to do what is right. That's changing direction. The next definition of repenting might be to turn around. So I'm gonna turn around for a second and I'll turn back. Okay. So turn completely away from what's going on in your, on your life that has held you back or held you down or kept you in a sinful pattern. That means to turn your back on like I just did my little demonstration. Secondly, it means to take a new direction, not just to be going in the old direction or a modification of the old direction, but a totally new direction. And then don't look back. And that's the temptation that we often get called into. And there's a, a key example of this in the Old Testament. And who remembers who it was? Lot's wife. Lot's wife. She looked back. And, it, and, and the message wasn't so much that Sodom was a terrible place. The message was that you need to move on. Don't get pulled back into the things that controlled your life before. So that's a part of repentance as well. So change direction, turn around. And then the third area is to drop and go. It almost sounds like something you tell to uh, a military person or to a, a first responder. So drop and go, first of all, means put it down. Secondly means is don't pick it up. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? Put it down, don't pick it up. Well, once we've done that, you know, the temptation there is we drop it. All of us drop it. We say, oh, this is my day of salvation. This is my day of repentance. I'm not going back there anymore. <laughs> oh, well, some of that wasn't all so bad. And then we pick it up or we pick up a little bit of it again. That's the, the great temptation that we have in our lives. So we need to say, 
don't pick it up. And then I would like to say walk away from it, but no, that's not enough. We need to run away from it. Don't just walk. And we need to run as far and as fast as we can. Get completely away from it. You know, it's easy, you know, some of you have dealt with some uh, addictions in your life. And it might be easy to, to look at the addiction and say, well, I had all these friends when I was addicted. Friends, they may or may not be friends, truly friends. They were companions in the addiction who need the word, they need the gospel. So I think I'll go back. I'm going to go back into that bar or back into that, that drug hall or whatever it might be, and I'm going to share the gospel. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do that, I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but I would tell you that it, is, it puts you in a very risky situation. So I would be extremely careful about those kinds of things. I think we need to run away. The second thing that verse 38 says, that we are to be baptized. Huh? Now there's a term that we're familiar with, and the, there's a context again in the New Testament. Well, first we see that Paul is, is told to be baptized, and he is baptized. When um, the message goes out to the Samaritans, the Samaritans are told to be baptized, and they're baptized. And also we see that the Gentiles are given the opportunity to be baptized, and they're baptized. Well, there's one other area, and that is the Great Commission. Going into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize. So it's actually told to us that we are to go baptize. And that's an interesting idea. Some of you might feel like you've been given the responsibility by God to go share the good news of Jesus Christ with people around the world or maybe even in the community here. And as you do that, he says we're also supposed to baptize them. Well, maybe we can't baptize them personally, but we should draw them into the opportunity to have the experience to be baptized. Invite them to Coloma Park and in uh, July when the river is only 47 degrees <laughs> and they can be baptized. So that's, uh, there are ways that we can in encourage people to do that. Well, there's an Old Testament tradition that leads up to baptism. And it was a ritual cleansing. It was, it was done in a, in a little pool. And Jay's taught us about this. Do you remember the name of that little pool? Mikvah. Mikvah. Very good. So when I taught this before, they had no idea what that was. I told them they were learning their first Hebrew word for the, for the year. So uh, the mikvah, and I think you understand how the mikvah worked. The mikvah was a, a ritual cleansing pool. It was used before any rite or ceremony. Things like a marriage, uh, probably a, a, an anointing for an office of some kind. It was probably also used, although I don't find the, the direct evidence, when somebody came of age. So whatever, whatever happened, you know the mikvah experience was when the person who was being dunked, we'll say that, um, went into the mikvah. It was a private place. It wasn't out in the public so much. And they went in there, and the first thing they did was to remove all of their clothing. Okay, And then they stepped down into the water. There were steps into the little pool. And as they stepped down in the water, and the water generally came up to uh, probably above waist high, but not all the way over their heads. And then they were told that they were to bend down. They probably hold their noses, I don't know. But they were to bend down until the water came completely over their heads. And then they were to rise up again, and they step out of the pool. Well, the symbology in the Old Testament was that this was like returning to your mother's womb. So we were in the water of the mother's womb and, and dressed just like a baby would be dressed in your birthday suit. And so as you did this, when you came out, it was like you were being born again. So this was something that was not an unusual thought pattern, not an unusual custom in the Old Testament. It was a symbolic cleansing. We know that it didn't truly clean them. It just was a symbol of the fact that they were going to, they were ready for this ceremony. It, it described the new birth and it was a preparation. So that's the Old Testament pattern that the Jews would have understood and we should understand today on why baptism was something that was in the New Testament. Well, the New Testament practice, when you look at it, everywhere it shows up is immersion, just like the Old Testament pattern. 
So it symbolized new birth, symbolized new birth. It wasn't the new birth, it symbolized new birth. Secondly is it was a public confession and witness. It wasn't something that was done in a little private pool someplace. It was done out in the public and uh, things like the River Jordan. You know, and some of you may even have been baptized in the River Jordan. And so it was something that was very public. It was done as a testimony and a witness of your new faith in Jesus Christ. And it was done to new believers. It wasn't done to new babies. Now, why would I say that? Well, take a look at today, the current application today in the church. And I'm talking about not this church, but the church. One of the ways that baptism takes place today is infant baptism. Infant baptism. So little babies, when they are some days old, even to a little bit older, are, are baptized in the church. And this is done by just the application of a small amount of water by the priest or the pastor to the baby, usually on the forehead, sometimes in the shape of a cross. And that's done for tradition, but they have a, a thought behind their tradition, and that is that this baptism of the little baby infant cleanses them from original sin. Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say this is true, but it is a tradition. Okay? Traditions sometimes become more important than truth in people's minds. But it's a tradition. Is it a bad thing to do? I don't think so. How many of you were baptized as infants? So, I'm raising my hand. I'm not just giving you an example. I was also. I, was, I wasn't raised in the Methodist church, but I my parents pretended they were Methodists. So once in a while we went to the Methodist church and things like that were the times when you went. And so there are churches today that still practice it. We, use, we do something that's not identical, but something with the same idea in mind, um, some of the same ideas in mind. We call it baby dedication. So we're basically saying, you know, we're dedicating the baby to live a life in Jesus Christ, but we're really saying to you parents, you have big responsibility, and uh, we're, we're going to stand with you. And that's what we're saying in that. So the Bible doesn't support that this infant baptism removes original sin. Sorry if that's something that you, you've held on to all these years. It just doesn't support it. It's not a bad thing. It's great to have that ceremony and to dedicate the child. And so I, I, I think it's not something that we just throw out. I don't think it's something that's fatal in the, the walk of a person. The second way we baptize today is adult sprinkling. So this is also supported by tradition. There's nothing in the Bible that indicates that anybody was sprinkled. Okay. So the adult sprinkling is much like you would sprinkle a baby, the, the priest or the pastor takes his finger, sticks it in water, and then puts a dot on the forehead or makes a shape of a cross on the forehead. It depends on their customs and their traditions. But it is supported by, by tradition. It's not really supported by the scriptures. So what if somebody was baptized in that way? Is that a bad thing? No, I don't think so. Uh, but it, 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 what was the purpose? What was the meaning? Was it a public confession of their faith in Jesus Christ? I'm not going to fuss about it. But the Bible strongly supports adult baptism by immersion. So that's what we do. And if, you, if you're comfortable with something else, praise God. So verse 38 and 39 talk about something else. They talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. And there is a New Testament context here as well. The Jews received the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans, who were, what, half Jew, half Gentile, they were an intermarriage between the Israelites and the Assyrians, right? Okay. And they stayed in the land. And then they were, it was also... Um, the Holy Spirit was also given to the Gentiles. So those are the ones who were totally Gentile, no Jewish blood at all. So that applies to most of us in the room. I don't know if there are any Jewish ancestored people here. If there are, praise God, you got it. You ended up in the, in the first category, not the third category like the rest of us. 
So why receive the Holy Spirit? Why? Is it important? Well, the first point I would make is the Holy Spirit is life. Now, spirit, I think it's called rauch in the, in the Hebrew, means breath. It's the breath. It's the breath of God. And by breath, he's not speaking about so much about physical breath, but I'll talk about it in just a second. He's talking about a spiritual breath, the life that comes. We know that breath is life, right? If we don't breathe, we die. Okay, so we need to have the breath of the Holy Spirit working in us spiritually in order for us to be alive in Christ. Secondly is that the Holy Spirit enables. You realize if the Holy Spirit had never spoken to your heart, you would never understand that you need a relationship with God the Father. So he enables us to understand the word. He takes the word and the preaching of the cross, which is foolishness to those who don't, who don't believe, and turns it into the wisest possible thing it can be. And he allows us the opportunity then to establish a relationship with our Heavenly Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. So, thirdly, the Holy Spirit is power. And it's, people think about power in different ways. And, and, and with the Africans, I like to joke with them a little bit because the, some of the people there who are teaching are teaching from what they've learned on television, from American television. Um, they, they either don't have a Bible or they just don't take the time to study it. It's, it's too much work. Um, so they, they pick up the things that American preachers do who tend to talk about the power. <laughs> well, the power of the Holy Spirit as described in his word is the power to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes power to do that. He's not talking about some, at least not here, some supernatural power that makes you superhuman. It makes you super rich or super successful. He's talking about the power to be successful for eternity, to present the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So he gives us that. So how do we receive this Holy Spirit? This is where you might think differently than I do, but when you look at the scripture the way it's worded, it says that this baptism of the Holy Spirit comes at the time you are born again. There's one baptism that comes to you when you are born again. So the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and we call that, often we call that the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you get it? Well, it's the ABCs of faith. Accept God's grace. Believe and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the ABCs. It's pretty simple. People would want to strive and to tarry and to struggle to receive this, but God says he will give it to us if we ask, if we turn our lives over to him. Well, when does it happen? That's salvation. I just said that. But there's more to it than that. The fact is that we need to be filled over and over again. We need to be filled over and over again. Why? Well, I think Jay's told us because we leak. Yeah, it's a memorable phrase, isn't it? We leak, we leak out, and, we, and there's a good leak and there's a bad leak. The, the, the good leak is that because we are constantly living in the Spirit and we are giving from us the Spirit to others, that's the good leak. The bad leak is, we just get tired in our walk and we get weak. So we need to be refilled. Secondly is we grieve. We grieve the Holy Spirit. And we grieve him by just taking him for granted. And we need to grab a hold of him and stay strongly living in the Holy Spirit at all times. So that said, verse 40. It's still Sunday, right? Okay. <laughs> Verse 40 says that we are to be saved from a crooked generation. This, again, has a contextual application. When you take a look at the Old Testament, Moses talked about the crooked generation of his day. And when you look at the New Testament, Jesus talked about the crooked generation of his day. 
And when Paul's writing to the Philippians, he talks about the crooked generation in Philippi. Well, guess what, folks? We live in a crooked generation. So it exists even today. Well, what does crooked mean? Think again, I mean, we, we want to look at the, at the context and the idea that he's presenting. And also remember the audience. The audience were theologians? No. Bible scholars? No. Peasants, fishermen, people who were simple, simply li lived people. I want to say simple-minded. That is a bad context, doesn't it? But they were simple-minded. They didn't have the they didn't have this tremendous reasoning content to their their the functioning of their brains that we tend to have today. So they were they were un able to understand things that were common to them. So crooked to them meant godless. It was a godless generation. It was something that didn't follow God's rules. It didn't have God in it. Secondly, is it was misguided. Well, misguided means if you're given guidance that isn't accurate and the goal is over there, which way are you going to go? You may be heading over here. You may be heading over there. You may be heading in totally the wrong direction. And where do we get our guidance? Well, we get our guidance from way too many sources. You know, Hollywood wants to guide us, doesn't it? And the, the, the media wants to guide us. And our politicians at Manny was praying about earlier. They have lots of different ways they want to guide us. But we know that there's one place where we can find the true guidance, and that's through God's Word and allowing His Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. Crooked also means lost. Now, today in the world of the GPS, we never get lost. <laughs> Unless your GPS gives you the wrong data, right? And I've had that happen to me. But it means lost. No GPS, folks. The crooked generation doesn't have a GPS. And so it means that you don't know where you're going. You don't have a clue where you're going or even where you are. That's what crooked means. Well, a generation part of, the, of this phrase. What is the generation? Yeah, but you know, we talk about a generation today is what, like 30 years or something like that. It's until the next children are born and then the next children are born and so forth. So it's around 30 years from a chronological perspective. But a generation means just your group of people, the people that you're around and you, and you deal with. So when we talk about a generation and you look at the generations past and the generation today and you can imagine about the generations in the future, what's changed? Really, there's nothing new under the sun. We still have the same old flesh and we still have the same old deceiver. So... It really hasn't changed. So we look at look at these examples from the Bible. It's not a whole lot different then than it was now. So what does it mean to be saved then from this crooked generation? Well, saved is a churchy term. And you might go out to on the street corner someday and you decide that you're going to share the gospel with the lost souls who are walking by. I don't know where you might do that. Downtown Georgetown, maybe at Founders Day. <laughs> and you'd say, are you saved? And they're going to say, oh, I don't know, what's that mean? Saved from what? Yeah. And it's a church term. So what does it mean when we put it into everyday layman's terms that we might be able to actually share with somebody? The first meaning is redeemed. Redeemed. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, Paul tells us that we are bought with a price. That means to be redeemed. If you're going down to the store, I remember when I was a kid, they had, they had savings stamps that you got sometimes and made purchases. And you could take them in eventually and redeem those stamps for some product. Well, that means you were being bought. You were buying them back. You were somehow making some deposit so you get a return. So being redeemed means to be bought with a price. Second meaning of saved is to be renewed. We're talking about being transformed in your mind. Where's the verse that says that? Romans 12, 2. So look at Romans 12, 2. We're to be, we're to be renewed by the...
transformation of our minds. Third way to talk about being saved is to be restored. And restored means to be returned to the peace that God intends in our lives and in his world. And if you take a look at Romans 5.1, it'll give you a little bit of, a, of some light into that area. Well, now we finally made it to verse 41. Whew. And it's still Sunday. So here we see a description of new life. So Peter has preached the message. He's answered the question. And here is the result. So in verse 41, the first thing we see is that they received the word. They received the word. Like you're receiving the word today. At least you're listening. And I don't see anybody in the room who has yet fallen asleep. So as, as you are listening, you are receiving the word. And a bunch of other words as well. So how do we receive the word? We talked about it earlier. The first thing you have to do in order to receive the word is to be prepared to understand it by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has prepared us. And we prayed when we began that we would be taught and under, we would understand. We're asking the Holy Spirit to give us minds that can understand, ears that can hear the Word of God as it's, as it's given to us. Secondly, as Peter presented the Word of God, they didn't have a Bible to turn to. They had the Old Testament, but they didn't have, they didn't have the Gospels, they didn't have the books of, uh, of Paul's writings or Peter's writings or James' book or John's writings. So, uh, they have what Peter preached. So he preached to them, presented to them the word. So then what happened? The people accepted what they heard and they were saved and they were also Holy Spirit baptized at that point in time. So they responded. Well, the second thing they, that happened then is they were baptized. Well, baptism, as we've already described it and you already knew, is the confession of one person, maybe one by one. So maybe you have several people who are baptized, but it's an individual experience each person has. But as each person is baptized, we, we experience a celebration for all. Everybody celebrates when one person is baptized. So it's an individual baptism, but a corporate celebration. And this baptism symbolizes the new beginning, a new beginning in Jesus Christ, born again, coming back up out of the water with new birth, new life. The result then of all of that was that 3,000 new souls were added to the church. How big was the church before that day? 120, 130 people. It's pretty small. So we don't have 120 here this morning. But let's say we did. Okay, let's bring 3,000 more in here. We'd have a tough time, wouldn't we? We'd have a tough time. We'd have to have, what, 10 services in the morning? And my voice would really be tired. So it would be, it would be interesting to see what would happen. But think of the, t the phenomenal change in the church just in a, a few minutes' time, going from a church of 120 or so to a church of 3,120. A big change. But do you know that each and every one of those 3,000 people was immensely important? Each and every one of them. Just like each and every one of you is immensely important to our Heavenly Father. And as a result of this, the angels rejoiced. So in heaven, as one soul is added, as 3,000 souls are added, the angels are rejoicing. That's recorded for us in Luke chapter 15, verse 10. Well, that's the story, folks. That's what happens here in these four verses. And I hope it reminds you of where we need to be. There's some things that we can do today. You may or may not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I, I know most of you, almost all of you, and I believe that you do. Some of you may not. And so maybe this is something that you're learning for the first time, something that could be a new experience for you. But if you've walked with Christ for a long time, you may be a little rusty or tired, a little worn out, and a little distracted, whatever it might be. So what can we do? Number one, have you repented recently? Not just back when you were saved. Sin sneaks into our lives. We need to repent. 
Number two, have you been baptized? Some of you, most of you probably been baptized. If you have not, what are you waiting for? Warm water? <laughs> I can understand that. But be baptized. It's something that the Bible says we ought to be doing it. It doesn't save you, but it's the witness to the world that you have been saved. It's important. It's a way to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Thirdly, have you told others about Jesus? That's something that he asks us to do. You know, if we weren't here to share the gospel with others, I don't know why we're here. Why didn't he just take us home? So we need to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And then finally, do you rejoice with the angels? When someone comes to the Lord, are you saying, praise God, that's just amazing. He's done it again. And another precious, precious soul in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that you love us and that you care for us and you desire our best corporately and individually. We thank you that you've shown us how we're to live our lives, that we're to repent, and not just once, but frequently. That we're to be cleansed and baptized. And God, for those who've not come to that point in their lives yet, I pray that you'd place it on their hearts if it's something that they should be doing. And Lord, for the receipt of the Holy Spirit, we know if we've been born again, you've given us your Holy Spirit, and we are so grateful. And may we not hide all that we've learned. May we allow it to leak from us to others, to influence others' lives for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray and, and just want to say thank you so much that you've added many to your kingdom and that there are more to come and that, Lord, we have an opportunity to share you with others. I pray that you give us the boldness, the, the power of your Holy Spirit to share your good news with others. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, be with those who are unable to be here today, Lord, that they would somehow come to the conclusions that we've come to today and to, to seek out to serve you better, to be more in line with what you want for your people. And we want to thank you now for our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.